and we are live with another Cafe Crash. I'm your host, Daniel Crozier, and I am here with the amazing, the super talented artist, Adri Norris. How are you, Adri? <laughs> I'm doing great, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> sure, it's it, it's 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 wonderful to see your 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 smiling face. Yeah, I've missed you. <laughs> I was thinking, man, it's been a while since you know drink and draw, and with none of the events that we usually run into each other at happening this year, it's been a lot, <laughs> a lot right. of time. Oh, I know. You know, uh, I, I think I, I first uh, met you at was it the first or second Dink? It would have been the second, I think. Yeah, over at the um, was it the McNichols the, building? The, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, over at Civic Center Park. Yeah, that that was that was awesome. I remember, you know, meeting you. Uh, you know, looking through uh, you know your 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 art, your paintings, and everything, and you had your your postcards. Of all mm -hmm. these amazing, uh, you know, uh, women that uh, have uh, you know made such an amazing uh, difference uh, in in everybody's lives, and uh, yeah, so yeah, I, I thought it was absolutely astounding, and I, and I kept thinking, it's like, wow, I can't wait to read her comics, you know, <laughs> and me neither, <laughs> <laughs> and. And uh, you know, I'm still I'm still waiting for that. But uh, but but uh, but but you've put out so many amazing books that uh, have been really educational and informative too. I mean, they 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 certainly uh, helped me because they introduced me to a, a couple of people that uh, I you know wasn't too aware of. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but but at the same time, it's uh, I think it's. Yeah, you know, it it's pretty interesting to to hear your story as well, because uh, I, I find you to be incredibly uh, um, inspirational and you know quite influential uh, in, in the community because you're 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 working with so many different groups and and people and and uh, you know and you're you're quite the educator as well. Um, enough enough of that, but. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself. You know where you know your your upbringing and and how you got into the arts. Sure. So uh, I'm actually originally from Barbados. Uh, that is an island in the Caribbean. In case anyone is wondering, it's very small. It's about the size of the letter B on the map. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, I lived there until I was about five years old or so, and then you know the usual immigrant story. Uh, one of me in one place tanks, we moved to a place where, you know, things look a little bit better. Yeah. Um, you know, my mom's side of the family was already here. So we basically came, lived with my grandmother and, you know, all that. Um, so I was in New York for uh, ages, what, five to 12. Okay. And then moved to New Mexico. Mm. Because, uh, yeah, so another fun part of the immigration story. Um, basically my mom was able to get a visa. My dad wasn't right away. And so, um, it was, it wasn't until, so I came over in 85, it wasn't until 88. My dad could come into the country, um, to work, wasn't able to find a job in New York. So he got a gig in New Mexico. Um, and so we did a lot of back and forth pretty much until 92. So we had about six years stretch, 12, seven years stretched where the family wasn't all together in one cohesive unit. Um, but, you know, during that New York time, uh, I was introduced to, I mean, so many things. Um, my mom, my aunts, they really wanted to make sure that, you know, my brothers and I had a good solid education. They took us uh, all over the place, but took us to the Met, took us to the, you know, symphony, took us to all kinds of stuff, you know, nice. uh, which was really cool. Uh, and so I was actually introduced, uh, I was probably around seven or so. Um, to a book by Leonardo da Vinci. And I was like, whoa, a person can do this? Like, and it showed like all of his sketches and like the big paintings and all this other stuff. And I was like, wow, like, like once you see that process, you know, you're like, oh, human hands touch this. This didn't happen by magic, which is how yeah. we, everything happens, especially at that age. Yeah. Um, and so I was probably around seven years old when I declared I was going to be an artist when I grew up. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so fast forward, you know, I'm in New Mexico. I'm probably around 13 years old. I had an art teacher named Mr. Mirabal, and uh, he was teaching us the grayscale. And I was like, 
oh, shading. Okay. So that was like my edge, my segue into like realistic drawing. Yeah. And then from there, I just devoured everything. And so um, got super into portraiture, always loved drawing, painting the face and just figuring out how to get likeness, expression, all the things that a lot of people hate about portraiture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I delved right into it. Um, and, you know, I've been a, a portrait artist ever since, you know. Um, I joined the military for a time. Uh, actually, let me roll back. So the, the place my dad was working in New Mexico was an international boarding school called the United World College. Okay. Uh, Two-year school, um, 75 countries represented in my youth. Uh, I think they're up to like 85 or 90 countries represented right now in the family of schools. And um, so when I became old enough, I got the opportunity to go to a similar school in Italy. So I spent a school year out there, um, did not do well. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently the uh, education system in Las Vegas, New Mexico did not prepare me for the rigors of the international baccalaureate. Uh, <laughs> That and the fact that, you know, as an American kid, I went from, you know, being a minor to being able to drink openly in bars, mm. uh, which is not to say that I drink heavily, but I just really enjoyed being there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I placed more of my focus on socializing, hanging out in bars and playing soccer than I did on my academics. So they asked me to leave. Oh. <laughs> well, at least you got, uh, you know, a good, uh, you know, a, a good integration into that culture. <laughs> oh, totally. definitely. I would say, yeah, it was pretty well, especially the soccer team, because I was um, I was playing soccer on the local team. So I was like the only non-Italian, non-local on the whole thing. Um, and so it was super fun. <laughs> yeah, uh, I had to just basically observe the coach and hope that the words that I thought I was hearing lined up with the actions that I was seeing. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that's right. The, the language barrier. Did mm -hmm. um were you able to, to pick up a, a lot of Italian? Funny story. I actually ended up picking up more later on. Um, so I, I'm, I've i always been fascinated by languages. And so a thing I started doing much later, this is like after my time in the military, which I'll get to, um, was watching movies in different languages that I was interested in learning. So um, uh, I was on guard duty and I had like two days on, two days off, 12 hour shifts. And sometimes those shifts would land on a weekend. And so I'm there Saturday, Sunday by myself in a building that no one's gonna enter, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I would like, you know, take, like I would go down to the, uh, the video store back when he used to do that uh, and rent <laughs> six movies. <laughs> nice. So, you know, account for each of the 12 hours that I was gonna be in the space. Yeah. And, I would just like, and they would all be in different languages. So I would have like French, Italian, and Spanish. Those were like the three that I would toggle through. Oh, cool. And I would watch them through on Saturday, read oh. all the titles and everything. And then Sunday, uh, I would watch them all again, but this time I'd be multitasking and be sketching or something. And so then I would be basically seeing if I could still follow the story without actually looking at the subtitles. Right. Oh, that's, that's, that's interesting. I, I have a, a similar thing when when I watch uh, um, uh, foreign movies. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I always uh, associate if it's a really good movie and it can, you know, it, it's good in, in its conveyance. Mm -hmm. It's pretty universal. So yeah. there comes a point where I don't have to read the subtitles. I I know I have an idea of what's going on just because of you know some of the universal themes. Yeah, that wasn't the case with something like Parasite. Yeah, no. Um, More nuanced. I've discovered that humor does not translate in the same way. Right. Necessarily. Like Western humor, yes. Um, I attempted this with uh, Arabic comedies. No, I have no idea. <laughs> I had no idea what was going on. I didn't know why things were funny. I, I was out. I was lost completely. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I... That's, I guess that's something uh, I haven't, uh, I haven't exposed myself to is, you know, Arabic, uh, you know, filmmaking. Yeah. But, um, I, well, I, I guess, you know, there, there's one horror movie that comes to mind. Um, uh, a woman walks home alone at night, I think. I think it's an mm -hmm. Iranian film. I might be wrong. Yeah, that would be in Farsi then if it's Iranian. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Nice. 
But uh, yeah, uh, yeah, what a what a great tool though to you know to sit there and use. Uh, but that was yeah in the military, and you were also a linguist too. In the military. Yes. Yes, let me roll back a little bit. I think we skipped that part in the story. So um, <laughs> after my time in Italy, they asked me to leave because my grades were really bad. Like literally, I was only passing Italian. I was taking English, guys. Taking- <laughs> 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 ah, you already know it, uh, English enough. Let's, yeah. It's a shame. Focus. Oh, it's so shameful. Oh. Yeah, so um, I actually had a chance to start over at the school where my dad was teaching in New Mexico, which is a total trip when you used to babysit your teacher's kids. And, you know, if you jack up your grades, they don't get mad at you. They just give you that disappointing mom look, you know. Yeah. So that happened a few times. Um, I just wasn't ready for academics at that point. And so, you know, Las Vegas, New Mexico is not a big town, uh, not really bursting with opportunities. So, um you know, it took me a minute to figure out what I wanted to do after school because university was not the next best step for me at that moment. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I had a counselor who told me that the military had like this language program that was really robust and, you know, you could learn a language from top down. I was like, all right, cool, let's do that then. (laughs) So um, that's how I I ended up in the Marines. they didn't tell me ahead of time. I only had a choice between four languages. So, you know, I picked the one that was most appealing of the four. Yeah. <laughs> wow. But, uh, but yeah, that's that's pretty cool. How how much of a, you know, how long did it teach you to or you know, take you to, to learn Arabic then? Um, it was a year and a half program. So, yeah, wow. about, around about 18 months, 17, 18 months. That's pretty good. Yeah. Well, it was super intense. So imagine like a typical high school or college day, right? Right. So, you know, you wake up, class starts at eight, uh, and you're going to class until about three. Um, Imagine every last one of those classes is Arabic. (laughs) You know, so we would switch back and forth between speaking, reading, writing, and transcription. And so transcription is basically like, you know, you listen to something in Arabic, you write it down in Arabic. Um, Yeah. And so, you know, it it was just that all day, every day, no major holidays. Well, only major holidays, but like, you know, no in-service days, no snow days. Um. (laughs) No, no snow. Yeah. Well, Yeah. yeah. Yeah, not in the military, not in Las well, Vegas. Well, not in California. So we were in oh, Monterey, California. That's where my training school was. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. For for some reason, I thought you were already overseas or something at that. No, time. no, no, no. Um, basically, what they do actually is they bring the um, the native speakers to you. So. Um, Okay, cool. So I learned from native speakers of Arabic uh, from different countries, though we um, stuck mostly with modern standard Arabic, though we had a, be- a brief module of like learning the different dialects, yeah. the difference between the different dialects, of which there are many. Uh, wow. <laughs> and they vary very widely. <laughs> was, was that something that was, you know, since you're learning Arabic, was that very confusing? Because, you know, once you need like, a, like, kind of a, a nice strong foundation before going in there or did they just kind of were they able to just throw everything at at, at mm-hmm. you and just like baptism by fire it was that i mean it was bottom up i mean like we were in school so you know baptism yeah. by fire i think is like you know you're you're out in the war zone and all of a sudden you got to translate stuff and you don't know nothing um right. so we were in school we were in classes we had you know tapes because tapes um <laughs> <laughs> We had tapes and textbooks and things of that nature. So like, you know, like in a lot of important ways, we were kind of eased in. It's just that the consistency of it was intense. Right, right. Wow. That's, uh, that's pretty amazing. Uh, I, I think, uh, well, I, you know, I remember learning Spanish in high school of which I, you know, I can't speak it anymore. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then I think there was a time after art school that I tried, uh, learning, uh, Japanese. Mm-hmm. I, I, I got to a point where I could write it, but I still couldn't speak it. <laughs> so, yeah. 
Well, speaking is the scary part, I think, for most people when it comes to learning a different language. I mean, if you're learning much of anything, really, but like, um, especially when it comes to language, you have to, in my opinion, everybody has their own way of learning. But in my opinion, um, I learn the way a child does. So, you know, a little kid doesn't learn how to read English before they start speaking English, right? You you talk at them, they babble some words back, you correct them, you know what I mean? And eventually they start picking up on the different cues, um, the different patterns, and, you know, they're starting to form full sentences. Mm -hmm. So um, I took my language education that way. That's, you know, the way I treated it. And of course, you know, they taught the way they taught, right? So we did have to learn how to write simultaneously. We did have to learn how to read. Um, you know, it's a completely different alphabet. They write from right to left as opposed to left to right. Um, yeah. You know, all these different things. Um, but at least for me, when it came to speaking, that was the part I was most interested in because of my international school background. Like I was super excited to be able to communicate with other people. Yeah, yeah. That's, wow, that that is pretty exciting to, to be able, you know, just universal communication is mm -hmm. what, what an exciting thing. You know, learn about new cultures and 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 all that. And, yeah. and all, all the time, you know, you're 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 drawing and and uh, <laughs> keeping up on uh, keeping up on that too during guard yeah. duty, no less. Yeah, no, uh, I would say the most hilarious, at least to me. I don't know if anybody else noticed, but like, uh, I was out in Kuwait on my first tour in the Middle East. And uh, for some reason, they decided that I was the one who needed to watch the motor pool. So it was basically a bunch of like Humvees and tanks and trucks and stuff uh, behind some barbed wire fence. And so my job was just kind of sitting on me and made sure they didn't go anywhere. <laughs> so yeah. I was sitting there with my sketchbook, my pencils, um, and colored pencils and like um, album covers. So I like I have a an album cover of like Shakira and I sketch oh, cool. you know? just recreating it? Yeah, just you know, practice. So that's like I said, portraiture's always been my thing. So yeah. um, anything that had a human face, I was like, all right, well what can I draw from this? Nice. Wow, that's cool. Mm -hmm. that, that that is a, a pretty cool visual, you know. <laughs> so, you know, drawing away well, you know while while in the middle of Kuwait. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Andoc, as I like to call it. <laughs> yeah. It, after the military, you know, um you you went to was it uh, the Art Institute, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yep, I went to the Art Institute um of Colorado. So like before I got out, um I had signed up to do the Art Institutes online. Uh when I probably had like a year and change left in my in my contract. Uh, and then they sent me out again. <laughs> so, I, you know, spent seven months in Iraq uh, and came back and with six months on my contract. And I was like, well, I might as well just wait and go to a brick and mortar. And so, you know, I just looked at all that the different art institutes had to offer. And I liked the program in Colorado. Cool. So I picked it. <laughs> so, so that's what brought you uh, out to Denver initially. Yeah. Cool. Came to I don't think I'd been, I, maybe I'd been once. That was it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Nice. Well, well, that's that's pretty cool. So, you know, yeah. Did you just uh, continue doing uh, portraiture, or did you uh, explore some other avenues? I actually studied animation. Uh, that's what my degree is. What? In. Yeah, no arts and animation. So, like, you know, I've been like pre comics for a while. I just. <laughs> <laughs> You just got to circle around that, huh? Just pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Oh man! Well, wow, wow animation! I, yeah. you know, that I, I, I did not know that about you. That's that's pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah, you no, know, another intensive program, you know. Um, yeah. So I did. I finished my degree in about three years because I had a bunch of credits from when I was in the military. I just took advantage of everything that I could. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, uh, yeah, worked a lot. Um, and by that point, I had like a whole different level of discipline. I was older than most of my peers, you know. And so I was like taking the full load of like five classes per quarter uh, while simultaneously sitting in one, like just basically crashing another two. <laughs> like, not even auditing. This is, I got no credits for any of these. I just sat oh, in. Jeez. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's wonderful dedication. 
Yeah. Well, you know, I had seen, um, you know, some folks who, while they were in the military, just bitch and moan and be like, I'm getting out, getting out as soon as possible. And then once they did realize they were not ready to be civilians and they went right back in and mm-hmm. I refused to be that person. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, man, that, that, that does take a, you know, a lot of foresight, I'd imagine, and a lot of personal discipline. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I'm glad you, you had that, you know, that, you know, initiative, you know, going for for you. Uh, I don't think I could do that. You know, I, <laughs> you know, we, we were talking uh, off camera about uh, how I, I get up, you know, ridiculously early and stuff. Uh, you know, back then I was still getting up early, but it was like more like a 4 a.m. type thing. And uh, it's still crazy early. The sun's not up yet, man. <laughs> oh, I, I like getting up when, when yeah, before the sun, you know, it's, it's kind of my reverse vampirism. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, I, I think past that, that is the, the level of discipline I had. Is I can get up and that's it. That's about it. <laughs> Anything else that happens, that's just an, a, a delightful accident. Yeah. <laughs> Fair so, enough. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I certainly admire that about you. The, uh, but yeah, yeah, nowadays you're, you're known for, uh, you know, portraiture of, uh, you know, as as uh, some of the book titles that you've worked on, uh, uh, women behaving badly. You know, yeah, that's a series. It actually started off as a series of paintings. Um, mm. I decided to. I mean, I, I I do art shows. I try to get at least one a year in, if not more. Um, mm. And by the time I booked that one, like I was showing at Coffee at the Point. So I don't know if you've been there. Um, yeah, cool little spot. Um, and so it was like my, my second year showing there and, you know, it was 2016 mm. president presidential election was going on. Oof. It looked good. <laughs> you know? And so the, uh, the curator over at the space was like, Hey, we should do something about women. We should do something about politics. And I was like, yeah, women, I'm not ready for politics yet. So let me just like, <laughs> <laughs> so I came up with the series, um, did the research, uh, cursory research to begin with, you know, whatever I could find on Wikipedia. I did not give myself a great deal of time to do that painting, that series. I think I did 10 paintings about four months. Wow. Um, Yeah, like rock them out. Um, And then have been kind of continuing my research since. So I'm like continuing to learn about the women in the very first set of paintings that I did. Yeah. Um, but in any case, uh, it went over very well. And the thing that I really noticed was um, how curious people were. You know, I had intentionally chosen individuals that I hadn't heard of up until that point. You know, um, it was a mix between folks that I had read about in, you know, some books and like putting polls out on Facebook and just asking folks for suggestions. Oh. <laughs> like, hey, oh. I'm doing this thing. I haven't painted any one of this group. What you got, <laughs> you know? And oh, so that's how I found some of the names that I, I painted. And so um, from then on, I felt it was really important to highlight those women who were not famous or at least not contemporarily famous, right? Um, many of them had been famous in their own times, but they're not now. Right. And really just kind of show the fact that we as a culture don't know much about women's history. Yeah. And so, you know, some folks would come and they'd look at the walls and be like, oh, man, I don't know any of these. I feel bad. And I was like, don't. You weren't made to. This is, this is not your fault. Yeah, that's so this is I have to do that category, too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it, to, to be able to create art and then, you know, have a, like, a, you know, formally educate your uh, um, your your patrons. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, yeah, with that, while doing your research, was there like any stories that you, you came across uh, with s- some of your subjects that were just incredibly surprising um, or inspiring? I mean, so many inspiring. I'm trying to think of who was surprising to me. I think, and I keep telling this story, um, I'm going to give you two. 
Okay. <laughs> so one, because I did not fully comprehend the breadth of her contributions. Mm. Um, and that was um, Marie Curie. So I was actually just thinking of her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, nice. yeah so that's weird. But uh, yeah, go, no, keep going. That's awesome. Yeah. So I had, I had actually heard of Marie Curie. Uh, when I was little, my mom had got us this book of, you know, this box of children's books. And each one had like a different historical figure. And they went into decent depth about them and their stories and stuff. So I was like, I know this one. I remember this one from the book, you know. <laughs> um, but once I started delving in, I was like, okay, you have this woman who was raised in Poland uh, at a time when the Russians were taking over and basically trying to squash Polish culture. So she was like not allowed to speak her own language, but her parents were rebellious in that way. And so she spoke Russian and Polish as a child. Yeah. Um, her parent, their family was poor because of discrimination and among other things. And so she and her sister made a pact to basically put each other through school. Oh. And so Marie worked and put her sister um, Bronia through school. And then when Bronia graduated, married, and she then worked to repay Marie. Um, she married a guy, they moved to France. And so Marie had the opportunity to go to the Sorbonne, which is a highly, in, you know, um, prestigious school uh, in France. So she's studying math and science in her third language. Oh, that's, wow. <laughs> graduated with honors as the only woman in the program. <laughs> Whew, <nice>. Went back <laughs> and got her second degree <laughs> and then decided to, um, you know, start her research project. Uh, mm -hmm. By this point, she met this guy, Pierre, who eventually became her husband. Uh, the two of them wanted to pick something that nobody else was doing. And so they decided to study radiation. Right. During the course of that, discovered two elements, uh, radium and polonium, got to name those. Nice. Um, radium ended up being the basis for all kinds of research, um, including cancer um, treatment research. Mm -hmm. um, their understanding of radium and polonium and basically how, like by, by them being radioactive, they were able to actually learn a lot more about how uh, the atomic structure worked. Okay. So that inspired Dmitry Mendeleev to make the periodic table. Oh, wow. Yeah, there wasn't one before. <laughs> oh, jeez. Wow. Yeah, That's so fantastic. You put that together in your head, right? Right. There's, so, there's, there's no way. I could I could do one of you know, the, the uh, mythical elements of Marvel comics, and that's, <laughs> but it's still modeled after the, the original. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So by figuring out how atoms work, they're like, oh, so nucleus, you know, protons, electrons, cool, um, figured out the atomic weights of things. And so when Mendeleev put together the periodic table, it had gaps in it, but he knew where the gaps, what could be filled in by that point. And so as future scientists made discoveries, they were like, oh, this has this atomic weight. It must go here. Nice. Oh, my God. That's amazing. That's so yeah, cool. Well, right. Yeah. Um, so like story's not even done, right? So she wins the first Nobel Prize. Um, so she's actually in, like, it was her, her husband, and another guy. They won it for, I think, chemistry first. Um, and that was in 1903. So that was like the second or third Nobel Prize given out. <laughs> you know, the third year that Nobel Prizes were given yeah. out. It started in like 1901. <laughs> right. That's, um, God, that's amazing. That's so awesome. Yeah, and then she won her second Nobel Prize in 1911 for physics for the same work because <laughs> they couldn't figure out at the time whether what she was doing was chemistry or physics. They're like, well, we give her one now and give another one later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's yeah. We're just gonna we're gonna hold this over until we can figure this out. Yeah, so, so she is one of four people in history to have won two Nobel prizes, and she's the only woman to do so. Wow, that's. That's fantastic. Oh my God. Fast forward to World War One. Mm -hmm. um, so by this point, like the x-ray machine had been created. She didn't do that. That wasn't her. Um, it actually happened before she started doing her work, but it was kind of like used for parlor tricks and stuff. It was like, hey, look, you can see my bone kind of yeah, thing. Right. Um, but during World War One, she realized that all these young men were coming home and dying from injuries that were not technically fatal. You know, you've been shot in the leg, shot in the arm, stuff like that. 
Um, but what was happening is these wounds were getting infected because the surgeons were not finding them, finding the, the bullets, right? Because what happens is a bullet will move through the body. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the course of going in, it's not hanging out at the entrance point, it's going wherever. And then if you leave it for long enough, the movement of the muscles, movement of blood, all of these things, they cause the shrapnel to move to different parts of the body than you'd expect. So she had the idea to take these x-ray units out into the battlefield hospitals, x-ray these young men, and then figure out exactly where the shrapnel was so they could just operate at the site. And so she and her daughter would actually travel to different battle zones and teach doctors, teach the military surgeons how to use x-ray machines. Oh, my God. That they could operate on these on these soldiers. And she saved hundreds, if not thousands of lives. Oh, my God. That's that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, Like and I'll just stop there. Like, seriously, she did so much. (laughs) Yeah. You know, she kept going. She had so many more, many more things. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those oh. wild, good friends with Einstein, you know, just they would hang out. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh my God! Oh, that's that man. That's so cool. So, so it, it sounds like it was, you know, a, just a fantastic educational, you know, road for for you learning all these. Absolutely. Yeah, um, and remains so. That's the thing. Like, I still am just like fascinated. You know, I'm still enjoying learning the stories and painting the portraits and and all the things that I get to do. Yeah, have have you um, like investigated uh, any um, um, yeah like uh, any of the places that uh, that you grew up in, like uh, like Barbados or New York or New Mexico or Denver? Like any <laughs> any local uh, you know people that uh, that you thought were pretty intriguing. I actually created a whole pack of cards. This is my women of Colorado. Women of Colorado, that's awesome. Oh yeah. my gosh. Uh, I, um, isn't that uh, uh, a news anchor on once? I forget her name. Yeah, Adele Arakawa. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Man, that's yeah. awesome. Cleo Parker Robinson and then Emily Griffith is on that side. <laughs> oh, yeah. I I, I have, uh, I think, uh, was it Emily, Emily uh, Griffith? That's, yeah, she's got a a school, correct? Mm-hmm. Exactly it. Yeah, because I think I've had friends that have uh, you know taught there, whether it's like welding or uh, mm-hmm. you know, technical uh, applications stuff yep. like that. Yeah, yeah, that's the focus of the school. <laughs> oh my god, that's that's so cool. Um, you know, did you find any? Well, obviously, all three of them were pretty inspiring. Otherwise, they would have made the cover. Right. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, what, what did you learn? Uh, you know, um, studying them. Um. Yeah, it was just so interesting because, like, I started with you know pioneering women, because um, yeah. that was kind of like the earliest you can go and still have Colorado be a state, um, <clears throat> and then rolled all the way into present day. Yeah. And so, you know, it was kind of crazy just seeing the difference in what women were, A, allowed to do, B, were doing, you know, and all the ways in which they had to overcome yeah. sexism, had to overcome, like, just the harshness of the environment. Because, you know, we experienced Colorado was already built up with buildings and infrastructure right. and all this other stuff. They came out and it was plains. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> and people trying to chase them off of land that they didn't belong on. So, you know, it was like a totally different vibe to, yeah. for them. And it also really made a point of um, having a split between uh, different ethnic and cultural backgrounds. You yeah. know, so we didn't want it to just be, hey, here's all the famous white ladies of Colorado. <laughs> right, right. You know, so it's a mixed bag. Um it was interesting to learn who passed through oh. here on the way. Grace. So uh, Golda Meir, who is uh, Israel's fourth prime minister and first female prime minister, um, is in the Colorado deck. Um, oh there are, there's a Native American woman, and I'm going to mess it up because I did these really, really quickly. <laughs> um, I want to say it was Helen White Peterson. Okay. who, um, you know, created this program that, you know, was like 
Oh my God. See, I'm like tempted to just crack open the deck right now and cheat off my own cards. Right. It, it's it's your cards. You totally can do that. I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but basically, you know, for to educate young people, like bilingual programs is what she created. Um, in addition to creating programs that were um, trying to keep Native American kids in Native American families. Because uh, I don't know if you know, there's a very long history uh, in this country of, you know, taking Native kids from their homes on various pretenses um, and having them basically lose their culture um, right. by being raised elsewhere. Um, you know, it was the boarding schools back in the 17 and 1800s and, well, most of the 1800s. Um, and, you know, various other practices that are still going on today. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've talked to like uh, Christina Badhand uh, about mm -hmm. some of that too. And, and uh, yeah, and I've come across, uh, you yeah, uh, some educational uh, videos on, on YouTube talking about that very thing. And yeah, yeah it's, it's uh, um, it, even like, uh, you know, white families adopting, uh, you know, uh, native, uh, you know, children mm -hmm. and, and doing and reprogramming them you know, in that, in that, that family structure. And yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It's, and, the it's thing is, like, and so much of it, I would say like, you know, top down, there's definitely malice involved, but like bottom up, you know, there's folks who are just well-meaning. They're like, yeah, you know, this kid was in a bad situation and I helped, uh, not really understanding all the ways in which that erasure is taking place just by them not being with their people, you know? Right. right. Uh, <laughs> Jason Larkin just chimed in. Word. Um, <laughs> he, he works with a, a lot of uh, uh, indigenous uh, families uh, helping to like rebuild homes on, on reservations and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks, Jason. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, Man, it's it's yeah, yeah. We 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 fucked up a lot of cultures, white white people. Yeah. yeah. Well, and here's the interesting thing that I I think a lot of folks are not really totally aware of. Um, there's a lot of white people who lost their cultures too. You know, sure. um, if you think in terms of the folks who came to Ellis Island, you know, back in the in the 1800s for sure. But um, even if you roll into uh, the World War II era, like, you know, World War One, World War II, where a lot of folks were flooding in from Europe, um, yeah. you know, they were not considered white at the outset. There was a whole list of people who, you know, were undesirable, so to speak, and they were mostly from, like, Eastern Europe, from Southern Europe, you know, so Italians, you know, um, and it wasn't until they more or less agreed to get rid of a fair amount of their culture that they were allowed to assimilate into yeah. Americanness, which ultimately is whiteness. Right. And so that's something that we need to, I think, talk about more consistently as well. Is like, you know, it wasn't just people with skin my color that were were damaged by by that practice. There were so many who were. Yeah. Yeah. Um I I remember my mom uh telling me that um my my great grandfather um came over when he was a child because his family was, uh, uh, you know, was evading uh, persecution in Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, they were Germans. And uh, so they, they, they came over, uh, you know, to, to evade that. And then of course um, my last name is, is French, but we pronounce it Crozier, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, so yeah, I was like, ah, Darn it. The original way was so much sexier. <laughs> I mean, you can still bring it back, man. I know. I really should. <laughs> you you know? correct, folks. You know, it's like, no, no, no. Crossier. Crossier. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, just, just like, uh, you know, how uh, how you were uh, uh, informing me on, on how to uh, pronounce uh, your name, too. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so, so yeah, uh, I think, uh, I think, I think that's, I think that's a really nice thing to, to kind of, you know, look back and, and uh, you know, address, well, at least have that, that conversation. Cause that's, that's one thing that, you know, so many, so many of us, you know, just don't have. Um, yeah. And, 
I mean, you know, I, I can only imagine too, like, like this year has been in, incredibly, uh, you know, daunting, you know, for all of us, but especially for, uh, you know, so many, uh, you know, uh, you know, black people and, and, uh, you know, Hispanic people and mm -hmm. Latinx people. And, um, I mean, just, just across the board, native mm -hmm. people. Yeah. Um, well, that's the interesting part, right? So this year feels like a lot, uh, while simultaneously this year is just more televised than ever. You know what I mean? Like we, yeah. from our perspective, none of this is new. Right. It, it's always been. Right. Um, just now that we're seeing it in higher definition. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and everybody's got a camera in their pocket now, you know, and so there's so many more opportunities to capture footage. Whereas back in the day, you had to happen to have a big ass thing that you sat on your shoulder and looked through in order to be able to see what was going on. Right. You know, it's super different. Um, but, you know, I think it is, as you said, it's so incredibly important to have these conversations mm -hmm. um, and to, I, I want to phrase this correctly. Um, Recognize where culpability exists mm -hmm. and simultaneously recognize where you don't have to necessarily take responsibility for the actions of others, but you do have to look at your own behavior and see where there's similarities and decide whether or not to change, you know? Right. Right. <laughs> would, you know, would you say too that, uh, you know, looking at one's uh, own actions, you mm -hmm. know, whether to uh, to engage in a situation too um, or not, like either way, you know, could also, uh, you know, inc you know, make a, a bad situation worse or, you know, better. I guess it, it depends on the scenario. I think, you know, education is a really big factor in right. how one can answer that question, okay. right? Um, I think it's really important to understand the context uh, right. in which certain things take place, you know, um, because a context in which you are perfectly safe, I might be very much in danger. Right. And if you don't understand where I might be in danger, you know, it is possible to make a bad situation worse. Whereas yeah. if you do understand, then you know how to maneuver and be like, ooh, how do I change this so that it is less dangerous? Right. Um, I, I uh, you know, one example I, I was thinking of is um, at work, uh, one of my friends, uh, Isaac, he's a, he's a young black man. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, a buddy of mine who was, uh, yeah, he fills in for me from time to time if I can't be on site. He came by, couldn't uh, <laughs> couldn't get into the uh, mm -hmm. uh, get through the gate, the locked gate, uh, mm -hmm. and worked to open up the gate for all the tenants, you know, uh, for shipping and receiving to come in. Mm -hmm. So he jumped the fence. There's a white lady that walks across the street and sees this and calls the police. Yeah. Well, you know, Isaac is is on on site, and you know, the cops show up. And I'm just I, now I'm worried for his his safety, mm -hmm. and you know and it's just like oh dear he yeah you know, of course he's you know he uh, you know just explained to the cops he actually had to stand up for my my coworker who jumped the fence yeah you know, and, and and everything was was cool but but now that I'm a little bit more aware of of like those scenarios I'm like I don't want to put somebody like Isaac in that situation. Yeah. And, um, you know, and it's only in the last couple of years that I, I've realized, you know, something like that can, can occur mm -hmm. and, and go south. Yeah. So, yeah. So that, that, that kind of freaked me out and, uh, yeah, he was fine. Everything was fine. The whole situation was easily diffused mm -hmm. and, uh, they just chalked, uh, you know, the, the lady uh, walking her dog as to another Karen situation. Right. Yeah. And it's, you know, I feel like this year, again, it feels so intense for so many people. Right. And right. it is, it's incredibly intense. It is, um, it's highly layered, right. <laughs> In right. Of intensity. Um, 
But one of the things that I, I hope continues once everything else feels like it calms down is that we continue to have these conversations, you know, and continue right. to really enlighten one another about what our experiences are. Yeah. And, you know, not in the sense of, you know, making folks feel guilty or whatever. And that's one of the, the things that I find a bit frustrating about <laughs> some of these conversations or how they wind up. You know, sure. Some folks were like, no, you're trying to make me feel guilty. I'm like, no, I'm just trying to share with you my experience so that you know. Yeah. Um, and that's really, I think, what it comes down to. And so, you know, in talking to you, you don't seem like you're taking on any guilt. You're just like concerned. And that's yeah. you know what one does for friends, regardless of what their situation is. You're like, yeah. oh, my friend's in an awkward or potentially dangerous situation. I am concerned for them. And I want to know how I can make it better. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that too. And, and the other thing, like a, a year like this exposes you know, the cracks in the, in the systems. Oh, so many. Yeah. <laughs> it was made of cracks. I don't know. Yeah. It's all yeah. held together with duct tape and faith. <laughs> I don't even think it's that. I think that, I think you're being generous. <laughs> it's, I, it, it just seems like everything's, it, it's, Either everything's uh, like teeters on on uh, you know like a unified belief in things will work into a system. It's like the economy, you know. It's you know it's like it, it's it's artificial. It it really there's no real value except as long as you believe there's value, there's mm -hmm. value. And yeah. that's it. and and it's it's uh, incredibly frustrating. Yeah, I um I've found myself thinking about this a lot lately and you know, I feel like we're in a rare opportunity if we right. choose to take it. If yeah. if those who are in power to make this change happen, take it on. Um where now that all of these things have been uncovered and been laid bare for the multitudes, um we can revamp this system, you know? Yeah. Like we had we had a forced pause. Yeah. You know? What if we take this pause to heart and be like, okay, this is our opportunity to shift things around. What if right. rather than, you know, creating a culture and uh, an economy and a society that is based around keeping the rich and wealthy in power, what if we actually started from the bottom up? What if yeah. we look at those of us who are the absolute most vulnerable and we made things easier for them? Like everybody benefits when things are easier for the most vulnerable. I mean, how many times have you, you know, leveraged the the ramp in the sidewalk, right? That that wheelchair access at the corner of every sidewalk, you know, whether you're on your bike or, you know, heaven forbid, you're temporarily disabled, right? And you're on crutches or a scooter or whatever. And like, you now have access to that when there's people who absolutely need it for their everyday living, you know, like, what if we what if we just focused on those of us who have the least, who have the biggest struggle and we just made their lives easier. Everybody else would benefit. Yeah. If, uh, you know, not only, uh, if not only government, uh, you know, invests in their people, but also, you know, society as a whole, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, and I, I feel that you're one of those, those people that are constantly doing that. Um, <laughs> The like the summer, uh, I remember you were uh, putting together a uh, mural project, right? I've done a few now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, done a few. but I think you weren't you one of the organizers too. Um. So I, I guess it depends what you're referring to. Um. I think it was it something with uh with Black Lives Matter or was it uh it was something in association with that too. Yes. Yeah, so I so I didn't organize this. Um. The okay. city had decided to do a Black Lives Matter mural. Oh, uh, nice. I was asked to be one of the artists on board, nice. and so I got to do the design um and create the mural. Uh, in partnership with another another artist, um, Pat Milbury. And so, um, yeah, I mean, the city organized, they, they, they got the cameras out, they got the media coming, you know, they, they paid us. Um, but, you know, I think I, the thing that I put into it was the, the message, you know, obviously the words Black Lives Matter had to be in there. I didn't make that up. Um, but I did add the words remember this time yeah. to the design. Um, and so, you know, that was meant to be twofold. It's like, 
remember all of the craziness that is going on. Remember all of the things that have been uncovered, all of the uh, ways in which, you know, as a nation, we've been enlightened to a lot of the ills that yeah. we've, that so many of us have been suffering under. And then simultaneously, remember, we've done all this before. So this time, please, can we just like keep talking about it? <laughs> can we yeah. this time like actually keep this thing going forward? Yeah. You know? Yeah, most definitely. The, uh, yeah, I, I, I find, I find it incredibly uh, inspiring, uh, you know, to, to see so many people, you know, out there and, uh, you know, doing the protests and, and keeping the conversation, you know, alive. Mm -hmm. And at the same time too, it, it, it helps to expose those cracks in the system that, that we, we, we discuss, yeah. um, you know, it's, uh, people committing violence against, you know, against others and, um, you know, certain uh, safety nets, you know, just not either not being there or not living up to what they're supposed to be designed for. Yeah. Uh, and even just, you know, yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting to see too, like during, during a pandemic, just basic, you know, um, niceties and politeness just going way out the door because you don't want to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, holy shit, this is the perfect time to wear a mask. You get to be a superhero and, yeah. uh, and, and save somebody, you know, by doing the, the simplest fucking thing. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, and those conversations are tough, but I, I, I actually enjoy having them because I feel I learn so much more from other people's experiences because they're not my own experience. Yeah, definitely. One of the things I've always found interesting is like, you know, I've, I've traveled pretty widely, I think for, for an average American. <laughs> um, and like anytime I'm in a situation with, you know, a bunch of Americans and a bunch of foreign people, there's so much curiosity um, you know, I was like, oh, how do you say this in your language? Or how do you cook this? Is this one of the foods you eat? You know, and all of this stuff. And I really wish that it would translate to back home. Right. I really wish that um, most of us would extend that same curiosity you know, of someone else's differences to our neighbors who are not quite like us. Right. Um, instead of, you know, this idea of forced assimilation, which is, is a legacy that goes from the, to the very beginning of this, the very founding of this nation. Yeah. You know, it's like, what if we stop trying to make everybody be the same? And I think that's one of the things that kind of keeps us polarized. There's a whole group of people who are like, hey, we're super different and we should embrace that. And then there's a whole other group of people who are like, no, you should be like us because that's America. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. That sounds... Yeah, uh, the, the homogenization just sounds kind of boring to me. Yeah. yeah. And uh, here's the thing that I found really fascinating is, you know, when I was going to school in Italy, um, you know, I so the way the, the schools were set up, 25% of the student body is from the country that the school is in. Mm -hmm. And then everybody else is from everywhere else. And so, um, you know, I was one of four Americans. Okay. You know, and that's like two in my graduating year and two in the year ahead of me, <laughs> you know? Um, and a thing that came up over and over again, regardless of what country the students saying it was from, was that Americans have no culture, mm. you know? Um, you know, like one of the things that we had to do was like bring our national costume to, uh, to the oh, school. Okay. If there were any performances or whatever, like you could wear that and represent your culture in that way. We didn't have one. <laughs> right. Uncle Sam? Uh, yeah. Pilgrim's outfits. I don't like what is that? Oh, uh, that's I, I don't know. That might be worse. <laughs> right? Exactly. And so, you know, I was like, it's hard to argue. <laughs> I can't yeah. argue with this kid from Romania who thinks that I have no culture because I'm right. like, can I pinpoint it really? Yeah. The the only thing I can really, you know, say to like American culture is this idea of like pop culture. Yeah. That's that's the only thing that I can see that is our culture per se. It's, you know, and, and that, but a pop culture is, is also made up of ridiculous amount of moving parts. So, mm -hmm. and it's just constantly changing. Um, but that, yeah. that doesn't make it, you know, you know, all that uh, meaningful maybe to different people, but mm -hmm. I don't know. 
That's all I. Yeah, I would say capitalism. Capitalism is our absolute. Yeah, no, I think you're right. It, and and to that point, pop culture is you know supported by capitalism. So yeah, yeah. Oh man, uh, Adri, it's it's been yeah absolutely amazing talking to you. Uh, you know, I, I threw up uh, your your uh, website, uh, AfroTriangleDesigns.com. Uh, for everybody that's watching, make sure you go there and uh, purchase uh, any one of or all of the you know, <laughs> women behaving badly, uh, you know, collections because they're incredibly, in, uh, you know, informative and insightful. And, you know, if you're curious, as I am, you know, uh, I, I think it's 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 a great platform to 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 learn about uh, all these you know wonderful women and and their contributions to society. Um, were you working with a, a writer too, or you know, on some yeah. of those projects? So um, funny story. Like, so we were writing, or I should say, she wrote a book um, about women in the history of Tanzania, and I was illustrating yeah. that book. Um, we have yet to find a publisher for that one, but we literally had a conversation this morning um, about doing a book about women in the history of Kenya, for which we do have a publisher. Nice. And so, um, yeah, there will be almost 500 entries. So we're trying to figure out the logistics of the whole thing. It would be massive. Yeah, but I mean, it starts from, you know, the colonization of that country all the way up until present day. Um, and, you know, she was telling about how like fascinating it is that women have, like in the early days, you know, it was like one every 10 years, one every 20 years. By the time you get into the 2000s, I mean, you got pages and pages of just 2010, you know. Um, and so like there was an acceleration in not only what women in that country could do, uh, but in the ways in which they were choosing to participate. And I think we would see that in our own history as well. That I think I think that would be incredibly fascinating to, to see that the especially um, like even now when you when you watch news coverage, like you watch news coverage with, within the U.S., uh, you know, it, it can be very polarizing, but international news coverage, you know, it's, it's something that I think is, is grossly missed oh. uh, in this country. Yeah. I, uh, I like watching some, something yeah, as, as kind of bland as, as BBC to get mm -hmm. a, an outside perspective, you know, on what the U S is doing and, yeah. and, and, or Al Jazeera. I, I find mm -hmm. that, you know, incredibly fascinating. Um, it, you know, just to see what, what everything else is going on around the world. Cause we're not just some microcosm. We're, we're part of a much larger tapestry, but we don't recognize it. Yeah. And, you know, going back to our previous conversation, I think that is some place that we would really benefit from paying more attention yeah. to, you know, not just in that sense of curiosity about the other, but just like what, in what world are we living as a whole? You know, how do we contribute to the whole world, not just this little place that we are? Yeah, this, this little sliver that we inhabit. Um, yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah. In in terms of the other, they're just our our brothers and sisters we haven't met yet. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Okay, we should do this again sometime. <laughs> we I, should. This is fun. I love this conversation. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Yeah, thank yeah, thanks for coming on. I I really, you know, I I I really do like talking to you know, obviously friends to stay connected and everything. Mm -hmm. But uh but at the same time too to, you know, to learn and gain, you know, new insights cuz I'm I'm just uh, some curious balding jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's good. You know, curiosity, I think, is the basis for all learning. Yeah. And if you're not curious, then what are you doing? <laughs> I know, right? And, you know, to, to that too, uh, artists, you know, we give the whole reason for, for living. We, you know, we help, uh, you know, lay out the plat uh, platforms for, for uh, you know, culture and, and uh, you know, enriching life. Absolutely. Not just a pop culture. Yeah, all of it. We are we are the creators of and documenters of culture. 
Yeah. Oh, you, you put it so much more eloquently than I could. <laughs> Had a little practice. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to take notes next time. <laughs> uh, Adri, thank you so much for, for coming on to the show tonight. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, to everybody that, uh, that was able to tune in, yeah, thank you so much. Have a good night. Uh, be good. Be kind. Yeah, help each other out. You know, we love you. Adri, uh, hang out for a little bit, okay? <laughs>